Okay, so let's start. It's uh, 255. We have uh, two out of four panelists on uh, in our session. Welcome, everyone, uh, to this session. I have just asked our conference support to maybe uh, invite uh, Ulf Daniel Ehlers and Daniel Schmelzer to this session, but there might be a technical glitch why they are not visible. Um, but let's let's start. Uh, we have a, a, sh a tight tight schedule, um, 45 minutes. Um, I'm uh, welcoming everyone uh, to this exciting uh, panel. It's about the new entrance and incumbents role. We're talking about the future of higher education in this session, and uh, we have a a great uh, a group of people as speakers invited. Um, uh, we have here. Uh, Dirk Kleine from Microsoft. Uh, welcome, uh, Dirk. Um, we have welcome. Rolf Reinhardt from LinkedIn. Uh, welcome, Rolf. Um, and uh, we should also have uh, Ulf Daniel Ehlers from the uh, Duale Hochschule Baden-Württemberg, uh, who wrote a seminal book on, on the, the, the future of a university in, in, in 10 years' time. There he is. Uh, very good. <laughs> what on? <laughs> Welcome, uh, Ulf Daniel. Hello. And uh, we should also have um, Daniel Schmelzer, um, who comes from, who joins us from uh, Future Skills, uh, a company, a startup company that is focusing on teaching uh, uh, professionals the right skills to succeed in their in their jobs and to make uh, companies perform better. So uh, how are we going to do it? Um, I'm inviting everyone to give a, a, a brief five minute pitch um, uh, on what their key theses are in this session. And, uh, and we'll go just, we'll go in the order that uh, with Daniel Ehlers starts, then uh, I hand it over to Dirk Kleine, uh, then uh, Rolf Reinhardt and uh, Daniel Schmelzer. And, and we should cover this hopefully in um, 20 minute sharp. That leaves us um, sufficient time to have a, a, a round of discussions and questions from myself. And uh, towards the end, uh, I would like to leave also uh, for questions from the audience. I see that there is always a lot of activity in the chat. So um, I am happy to hand it over to Ulf Daniel Ehlers now. As I said, he wrote a seminal book on uh, the future of higher education or the future of of universities in, in Germany. Uh, it's a book published uh, in 2019 by, by Springer. Um, oh, welcome to this session and um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Very, very nice to be here with you all. I try to be very brief. Um, we are actually conducting a big study, a multi-stage study uh, on the question how universities should be um, developing in the future. The question is really, what can we do and what do we need to focus on in order to meet the challenges so that our graduates are able to shape this society with all its challenges. And it's not just the pandemic we are living in now, uh, it's also the climate change. We have uh, populist streams coming up everywhere. We have um, um, the challenges of um, internationalization and how can we collaborate in a peaceful way with each other and all these challenges. Uh, we need to shape as societies and we as universities have to play an important role there. So we went out of the university and we went to companies and to civil society organizations and we interviewed experts and asked the question, which are these abilities which are needed in order to be ready for the future, in order to be ready to act successfully in such a, such a yeah, vague, such a fluid, such a um, untouchable, such a unpreparable future we are we are facing really. And what what was told us uh, can be summarized, I think, in three or four very very short points, which I would like to make. The first one is that we have to deal with a situation in which we see that um, society is. In, um, um, in a status of emergence, not of emergency, but of emergence, emergence. And emergence means that the developments which we are facing in the future, tomorrow, cannot be explained any longer by knowing the past. So 
we really have to be ready to understand what we are faced tomorrow in our society by not being prepared really by can by by the unable unability to be prepared for that and the question is what can we do how can universities in how can we as high end uh, education institutions in a way um deal with this situation you know that there is not a, a future we can prepare our graduates for and there is a very simple story and um, it's not just digitalization which has this impact but it is also digitalization which has this impact and if you just think back about um, 13 years ago uh, it is 2007 and the first iphone was 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 sold and what has happened since then how the world has changed since then yeah if you think now 13 years ahead you come to the year 2033 that's the year when my son who's 10 years old now will graduate from university hmm. uh, and then he will start to work and until 2060 maybe he will work and tell us what what do you know about this world what do we know about society in 2033 we do, do not know anything but we are still following this paradigm of being of 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 preparing students this paradigm of wanting to prepare students for the future and i think that's the wrong way and that's a big point to say we need more to focus on um preparing students for the unforeseen and that's actually the big big question how to do that and the good story, the good news is that in education, we have already those models which we need. For example, the model of reflection, the model of re the reflective practitioner, etc., etc. So we know what to do, but we need to implement it. We need to implement it deeply into our educational models. Mm -hmm. Then secondly, um, what we can see is that the notion of self-organization and of self-development, that's what the experts are telling us in our studies, the notion of self-organization and of self-development, of individual development, uh, being an expert for yourself, that these are abilities which will in the future be much more important than certification of external knowledge, okay? So what you really can do, what you are really able to be, be able to perform your experience, you need to bring to the table and as universities and as also education systems in, at all. And I, I'm uh, happy to hear what uh, Rolf is going to tell us about uh, LinkedIn's approach. Uh, we, we are going to focus on more on micro credentials, on certification of alternative credentials, et cetera, et cetera. So the third thing is, that we need to make a turn from knowledge to competence. Knowledge was the currency of the past. Competence is the currency of the future. Knowledge is not unimportant for the future, but it's not enough. We need an, an, a new understanding, a new mode to think about knowledge. Knowledge is just one, one building of competence. Other building blocks are values like uh, uh, peace and freedom and uh, valuing others and understanding, perspective taking and so on. Yeah? So, so values are important also apart from knowledge. Uh, other building blocks are things like motivation, yeah? mm -hmm. understanding, responsibility taking. These are all building blocks of competence for the future. Knowledge is just one of it. It's an important one, but it's just one of it. It's not enough. Future skills are knowledge plus something else, okay? So that's uh, the, the third important point. And the fourth one is that we are going to face individuals and we are preparing students for a world in which they will work in organizations which are less and less structured in hierarchical forms where they are told what they have to do. But much more in networked forms in which they will work in changing diverse teams in which they have to find an agenda for what they are doing in their market with their clients whatever they do themselves and communicate that in the right way so these i think are the four most important points and we have structured an entire future skills set of 17 future skills profiles around that 
are now infusing that into higher education institutions, into didactical models, into teaching and learning models, um, and uh, hope to get you all on board with us. Uh, everything which we do is uh, available open access at nextskills.org. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much for almost sticking to the time. Uh, five minutes uh, pass rather quickly, so I will uh, alert everyone when uh, once four minutes are, are over, so that we because I really want to make sure that we have su sufficient time for for a discussion in this session. So, uh, uh, Dirk Kleine from Microsoft, uh, please give us your perspective um, from the corporate world. Just one question. Can you see my screen now? Uh, no, not yet. No? No. Oh. Sorry about that. So the Microsoft yeah. guy cannot do without chat. <laughs> my screen now? Yeah, yeah. Now we see it. So it's a very different approach, you know, than taken by my colleague, you know. So I will just briefly talk about what Microsoft is actually doing in the field of education and, you know, whether we would be considered as a new incumbent to this, right, or a new entrant. And, you know, in preparing for this press uh, panel, you can see, you know, that there has been lots of buzz in the press about big tech entering higher education, right? You read in the headlines from Forbes, and these are all articles uh, from 2020, you know, that Google University will play against Microsoft University in year 2025 in the eSports game, game, and something similar that happened, you know, when Harvard University was playing Yale in football. Right. Then there's a headline is the end of a college as we know it, uh, build technical skills with Google and Microsoft. You don't need college anymore, says Google. Big companies have got university in their size. So a lot of busts, and this is mainly due, or the initiation is basically based on Google, Microsoft, but also Amazon and Salesforce introducing micro degrees and certifications um, actually um, to push you know, technology skills. So as you see, quite some high, but the question is really, you know, are we a, be, a new entrant, you know, and what is our role in the future being Microsoft? So as you can see, and that's my first message, you know, we have and will always be an enabler for digital transformation in education. And this is our framework for educational transformation. I'm not going to deep dive into this, right, but it's about managing student success. It's about modernizing teaching and learning, empowering research and providing efficient and effective digital infrastructure. And this model we actually use in discussions with uh, higher education institutes to lay out their new digital strategy. And of course, you know, and this is not a product pitch, uh, we have a couple of platforms for transformation, you know, software products, infrastructure products. I think some of you might know Teams, right, that has been very critical, you know, to university success in, uh, in pandemic times. But all these products, right, we actually pitch to universities, we partner and try to make them more efficient, but also more innovative when it comes to um, learning and teaching. So, but, you know, and this is our traditional role, and I think many of you will have seen us or partnered with us or talked to us, but why have we uh, launched these certifications or micro degrees, right? And as you can see, the shifting demand for skills in 2030, there's a McKinsey Global Institute work workforce skill model, and what you can see is that technology skills are actually growing by 60%, right? So this is pretty magic, and we all know that even today, only 33% of the world's demand for employees with, tech, with technology skills are being met. So as, you, as we all know, you know, there's a big shift to this technology skills, you know, they're growing and we don't have the people, right? And the industry demand is very, very high on these skills. And that's very simple, you know, the reason why we launched Microsoft certifications can be found on Microsoft Learn platform and same has been done by Google, right? So, you know, they also offer certificates and micro degrees on project managers, IT support, user experience. We do on AI engineering, data science and stuff like this. So we offer this online courses for very, very cheap money. So if you want to do a degree, you pay like a hundred dollar and then you get a Microsoft certified degree or Microsoft uh, uh, micro degree that enables you, um, you know, to do technology work in your job. These are the platforms, right? All these skills can be found on, found on Microsoft Learn. Uh, we have LinkedIn Learning. Rolf is going to talk about it. Let me just uh, mention one project, which is called IT Fitness Academy. So we are actually partnering with universities in Germany on, you know, what we call IT Fitness Academy. So we are actually distributing 
our courses as part of the curriculum um, to make students more fit when it comes to technology. And this is not only for uh, students working in information technology, this is also for students, you know, who study management or uh, biology. And then, you know, we also partner with universities to create content. And one of the major topics in Microsoft is really artificial intelligence. So we teamed up with INSEAD and have done an online course on uh, what we call the Microsoft Artificial Intelligence Business School. It's for executives and people really want to learn the, ba the basics about artificial intelligence and how they can deal with it, how they can exploit the potential. It's for free. It has, it has a couple of, um, you know, industry segments that it is focusing on. One of them is education. And if you like, you just, uh, you know, hop on this free course and get a little bit familiar of what AI can do in um, in education. This is my last slide. Um, as I said, there's a lot of buzz about tech companies entering higher education, but you know, Microsoft has and is always uh, has always been an enabler for digital transformation. Looking at infrastructure, productivity, and collaboration, we have offers these micro certificates now in li in line with Google and you know with Amazon and also Salesforce. And we want to partner with universities and online aggregators, you know, to distribute these certificates to supplement traditional degrees. That was my story, and I think I kept it in five minutes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, almost five minutes. Great. Thank you very much for that. So, so um, handing it over to Rolf Reinhardt uh, from LinkedIn, who also prepared a, a short uh, introductory presentation. Uh, Rolf, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. So my name is Rolf Arnott and um, so the title is A Backbone for Lifelong Learning. So LinkedIn Learning is of course not the only one or so. There are many platforms, or similar platforms. But LinkedIn Learning has a couple of advantages that uh, I wanted to show you, which are very remarkable for universities in particular. So if you look at your own journey throughout life, uh, so you see that you have done probably a couple of jobs and so, and the interesting thing is that, for example, I work now at a company, LinkedIn, which didn't even exist at the time when I started my university. And um, so it's not just that I could apply some of the skills that I learned during university. Also, but in particular, I acquired new skills throughout the way. And these skills would need to be acknowledged also, to some extent. So um, LinkedIn is basically a relatively large professional platform with 722 million members and an impressive amount also of, you know, skills and universities on it, so 90,000 universities. So but what's most important is basically that we can connect the dots, you know, so we can basically see what skills are emerging in regards to a certain occupation. We can see uh, where are the graduates of a certain university, what happened to them one year after graduating, five years after graduating, etc. you know, so we can track all that. And um, so, what we have done at one stage as LinkedIn was to purchase like platform, which is called Lina.com, a video-based learning platform. And this is what I show you now. So it's basically a very um, yeah, easy to digest look and feel. It's maybe also the, the success model of it, uh, that it's so easy to understand. It's kind of the tailor learning of the 70s with some advantages, for example, that you can combine macro learning and micro learning. But um, it's potentially open. So all of the speakers before that were very engaging are very welcome to, you know, apply for becoming um, like a, a trainer uh, for LinkedIn learning with their respective topic. Because this is what we look at in particular and what determines a little bit also the success of LinkedIn learning. It's the engagement. And then you see like uh, here down, you see that there are a range of things that you can do when you have obtained or gone through the course. So uh, there are, uh, for example, these continuing education units, and those are basically like micro credentials, similar to ECTS. So those are valid in the US, but um, who knows, you know, when there will be also like a, a value such as ECTS, not being a university our, uh, on our own, but partnering, for example, with accredited education providers, what we do in the, uh, in the US as well, you know? So like everyone says, okay, this is an interesting, uh, lecture or curriculum that we could use within our studies. They could say, okay, I would accept someone who, you know, learns that maybe um, in a workplace setting and comes to uh, like an assessment or to further studies to our university. 
And um, what is actually pretty interesting, so um, when we look at the topic, skills and degrees, skills are kind of becoming more and more important. We, we've heard it like a couple of times today, uh, not only in relation to the future skills, but also general skills related to occupations. Uh, so, And the interesting thing with LinkedIn is that it's basically, it doesn't really matter where the skills have been obtained, if with LinkedIn Learning or somewhere else. Uh, so informally or you know, you just had that or you used that, uh, you know, what, what we've heard before from uh, Jonathan Sill, concentration and focus as a, a future skill and you learn to just dig deep into something. Most importantly is that you get recognized, you know, externally, so that also your employer could eventually recognize you. And why is that so important? Because, you know, like employers becoming increasingly agile, they want to see what skills do they possess what skills are coming in uh, from entrance and what skills are leaving. And then they can take this decision, should they hire the skill gap, uh, the, the missing skills, or should they develop it internally? And this internal developing becomes even more important. But if they consider to hire, they will see something like that. Okay, and this is basically what LinkedIn is as well. It's a search engine where you look into, where you use a certain algorithm. And that's very important for you as the designers, you know, of a curriculum that might also lead to employability. Uh, I mean, students would like to have employability and it's a big topic. It, it may, might not be the topic for every uh, academic, but if you go into that, then the question is, of course, how can you, you know, equip your students uh, with, the, with the skills that are, that are basically sought after him? Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly, if someone applies, also they can basically see what skills do other applicants have and what skills are they missing? And then can they say, actually, I do know English or I, I have some of these skills, then they state that. And it raises self-awareness. I mean, this awareness of one's own skills was also like uh, thematized today. So like, um, you know, closing with, uh, with uh, you know, may maybe uh, <laughs> some statements that, that would be not new to a lot of people here, but yeah, the problem is of course not uh, only how to prepare for an uncertain world, but maybe to anticipate the skills that are needed relatively um, soon. Uh, so, and data can basically help you. Uh, so platforms like LinkedIn or also uh, what ILO does and others and so on, uh, that's actually important. But for you as educators, I think it's important to also become a little bit more permeable in your structure, you know, like create, if you look at micro credentials or so, looking also how to create a curriculum in a shorter time in order to, you know, like create these skills or equip the students um, of, of your university, you know, with the skills that are sought after at the workplace. So that's that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rolf. Um, and now I'm handing it over to Daniel Schmelzer from the from from Everskill, um, a startup in the uh, upskilling market. Daniel. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Very good. Uh, as I had some, also now I had some technical problems in the beginning in the in the backstage. So it's really good that you that you hear me very well now. Um, I when I thought about about the topic of this new entrance and incumbent roles, I thought about uh, three basic uh, three basic thoughts that went through my head. And basically, the first is uh, very much building on on Ulf's topic. Um, and I would call it a major shift of paradigm in higher education. Um, you are called it competencies, and competencies, I think, is, uh, I, I would use this very similar word, which is for me, is skills, and I think that's also what, uh, what Rolf claimed. Um, the paradigm shift to me is higher education systems shift from knowledge uh, to skills, and I think that has been said uh, I don't know how many how many times now, but I think uh, that is something uh, which is much more fund fundamental um, than anything else in this uh, in this session. Much more fundamental than any any other development. Uh, if we think of a university degree today, we think this is the one hundred and one thing you need to know about the economy. This is the one hundred and one things you need to know about psychology, and then you're an economist or you're a psychologist. In the end, I think for the future, for today's world, it's about competencies, it's about social competences, it's about being able to 
use methods, so it's method competency. It's self competency, it's about being able to work with yourself and it's media competency, like the last thing that we were just been working about um, and the last thing that we've been struggling about backstage here. And if you think about those four skill sets, I think the major shift that I see in institutions or that I see is underlying the institutional issue is going from acquiring knowledge, the 101 things, the 101 things you need to know about your subject to acquiring a certain skill set. And if that's the major paradigm shift, going from knowledge to going from skills, I think that results in two hypotheses that I can derive from that. The first thing is that delivering knowledge will completely disintegrate or will, will, uh, will, have a complete, will be a completely different stream um, and be located with some lighthouse institutions as I see it. So I think if I think about delivering knowledge in the future, I will not be thinking about my local university, but I will think about some lighthouse institutions. I might be thinking about a major university for university skills, but I might also think about Microsoft, Amazon, um, or the big tech players for other knowledge bits. So I think that delivering skills will really concentrate on those lighthouse, uh, on those lighthouse institutions that will not be more than a handful also in Germany for some very specific topics. So if number one is the paradigm shift from knowledge to skills, and number two is you have some lighthouse accounts that actually built on the knowledge delivery, you have to ask yourself, what is about the skill set? How do you deliver the skill set? And I think this is what higher education will be then in the future, the 98% of other universities or institutions that are not those lighthouse knowledge builders, they will have to teach their students how to actually acquire skill sets. And that is not a, how it is taught today, or as I experienced university, uh, when I was back at university, getting the introduction to whatever topic you just study, but it's small project work, it's working socially with other teams, it's problem solving competencies and the future university, like the regular universities that I see on a day-to-day -day basis in Germany, they have to teach students how to be able to actually live in today's world. And, I'm, and I wanna really say, it's really stress that argument as well. It's not about being employable, it's about being able to handle today's world, its complexity, its technology, its fast changing pace. So the role from universities or general university, I think might then shift from really helping students to acquire skill sets. So knowledge to skill first, which is the paradigm, shine, uh, the paradigm shift. The second, a few lighthouse institutions that will deliver the basic knowledge that you need and that you, that you might even need during your life, lifelong. You've been talking about a lot of, lot of micro credits, Dirk and Rolf. I think that's the knowledge part. And the third part is university degrees and universities being able to deliver competencies or skills to students that they're able to handle today's world. Mm -hmm. Great. Perfect. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting input. Uh, we'll now have about uh, 10 minutes for uh, 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 for some discussions and I'm starting off uh, the discussion round with a question to uh, Ulf Daniel Ellers. Um, uh, what I really appreciate is that you, you, uh, you said that uh, uh, institutions need to uh, prepare students uh, for the unforeseen and to get people self-organized um, and, and also to teach them competencies. Um, uh, and since we are a private university here, I wonder um, who, who is better equipped for this change in the next 10 years? Is it public universities or private universities? Or is there a difference at all? Does it matter whether private or public? I don't know really. Um... Um, who's better equipped for the change is one question. Who's having the majority of load to carry on their shoulder is another question. Where are most students is a third question. So um, it's, it's uh, it, 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 the question who's changing faster is not who's relevant. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same, not the same thing. But um, uh, when we have asked our 
our experts worldwide. What do they think are um, elements of future university scenarios? Yeah, and one element which they said uh, is going to become relevant in university education is um, uh, personalization and individualization of curriculum. So that means that students which come to university are not um, having to study with a predefined curriculum, but they first develop their own curriculum. And you can see that um, uh, in some universities in Germany, Jacobs University, for example, Zeppelin University is doing this, where students in the first uh, say, uh, few months are doing project work and are investigating what is their what is suitable for them and what they come up with is what they develop as their own curriculum is then um, um, presented to an academic board and valid validated uh, and then they start to study so it's not that they are left alone but it's really um, uh, giving students ownership of what they do in order to tell them it's important that you are taking responsibility for this, that you as an academic in the future are, are supported by us as an institution, but you are in the driver's seat really to start from day one with this kind. So this is a future university scenario where we believe and our experts believe that the private universities are probably having it easier than the um, the uh, uh, public universities to change in this regard. And uh, in Europe, when you look around and we are gathering examples of these kinds now, uh, you can also see. Also the introduction of micro-credentials, recognition of prior learning. These are issues where um, private universities um, are a bit quicker to, to adapt, in, in my feeling at least. Yeah, But it's not a question of relevance, it's just a question of changing quicker now. <laughs> yeah. no, this is, uh, we, like, we, like, we like change and we like speed. That's uh, exactly why we're here for. Um, uh, Can this I one question? Just, you know, because we have all talked about like skills, you know, becoming so important. I, you know, as I'm not, you know, in the academic world, what does it mean for the uh, uh, classical degree, right? The bachelor degree or master degree? Is that going to be a collection of skills? Is that going to be... Yeah, you, you just read my thoughts because this is okay. the question I wanted to ask Rolf Reinhardt uh, as well from LinkedIn when he showed us all these uh, skills and competences. Uh, the question is, in 10 years time in a, in a prospering job market, what matter does a BA or MA degree, uh, what, what does it matter if you have a BA or an MA degree versus you, you have the right skills and the competences? So uh, maybe from a LinkedIn perspective, please. Hmm. Yeah, I could say that in some protected areas like in law or in medicine, it would matter. Uh, so for most uh, other areas, it would probably not matter so much. And I think that this uh, scenario that Ulf has drawn about the University of the Future, that's pretty relevant. You could say also that maybe in the future you would not be a full-time study, but you would work, maybe volunteering work or so, study, you know, maybe distance at maybe the best universities, like, uh, you know, Daniel called it, like with, you know, at edX and so on, and then mm -hmm. create your curriculum, have a, have a counselor who says, okay, this fits well together, and this is what you could maybe apply at uh, the job market, but, um, yeah, so now, you know, European level, what they are already doing with that uh, European digital credentials infrastructure is to look into how can we unbundle a bachelor degree. A bachelor degree still might have some sense, but it's not probably the gold standard anymore. But when you ask employers, interestingly for them, so like a bachelor is maybe not so important anymore, but for the employee, to be recognized for his skills, to get them recognized externally and to build something towards a degree, towards a goal, would probably still make sense also in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this. Um, a question for Daniel Schmelzer. What can um, uh, universities, incumbent universities, learn from, from startups uh, in a way? Aren't there, they be, I mean, are they, maybe the better uh, the, the better educators like the the a startup that that, that you have that, that you're with um what uh, what can we learn well, that's a very interesting question what you can learn from startups 
I, I, I would again um, stress the point that it's, uh, it's about learning skills. Um, if I look at, uh, and I, I wouldn't frame it as a startup, but frame it as an, as an employer, I look for somebody who's capable of solving problems. I look for somebody who is a capable of working in a team. I look for somebody who is able to organize himself and make sound decisions for himself. Um, I think a university can very much learn looking at that, at that type of skills more than what do I know about X, Y, or because I can all learn or gain that knowledge doing my job, doing my first job uh, interaction. What is much more difficult to learn is problem solving competencies, is social competencies. So I would say really fundamentally changing from the point of view from looking at what does that person know about economics, psychology, as I said before, and looking into how do I teach and also evaluate how that particular student learned skills, competencies, however you want to frame that term. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we ha I have a question for uh, Dirk. Um, so, I mean, I guess we understood that Microsoft is rather an enabler than, um, than a, a game changer in the education sector. Um, but I, I still don't see why Microsoft wouldn't be uh, a driving force in the education market as an, as an educator. Because, I mean, you have already, uh, do, you're doing so much certification in the Microsoft environment. And, and you pointed out that, that the IT skills are in such high demand. And, and uh, we, we, we are, there, there are these startups around that do IT boot camps. And I, I mean, to me, it would be obvious if Microsoft would just uh, start its Microsoft uh, boot camp and, and teach uh, and do it like, like, an, like an education company. I mean, not as, a, as someone who sells the software and the technology, but really teaches people how to program and, and, and get, a, get a Microsoft degree. I mean, why is that such a far-fetched thought? I think our core business is technology and software, right? This is where we do most of our revenues in. And then, uh, you know, we also have LinkedIn, right? That's part of the Microsoft family. So, you know, with the LinkedIn platform, we are already, you know, having a broader range of, you know, offerings, um, you know, that are available to students or universities to partner with, right? Mm -hmm. And the training we do right now, and same is true for, you know, Google and Amazon is basically on our products, right? Of course, we want to educate the people on technical skills, basic te technical skills, but they are also around our products, right? In order to leverage this knowledge on our products and make them better, right? And, and ground them at the customers, right? So I really, and I discussed with a couple of people in Microsoft, I really can't foresee, you know, that there's going to be a Microsoft university where you can study and, things like biology and stuff like that uh, you know that's something you know at least in my little position here in germany you know i, I would very much doubt for the future okay okay yes uh, thank you very much we have now uh, seven minutes left inga is there are there any questions from the audience that, that they uh, uh they want to ask um, yes, Reimer, thank you very much. Um, I like to point out a question that was raised by Claudine and she was wondering, how do you deal with resistances for change? Organizational, heavy past or reputation of traditional famous universities. Now, um, I just, you know, um, leave it. Uh, who, who, who likes to uh, answer? So it's the organizational resistance, not the students' resistance, right? Right. Yes. So maybe Ulf, uh, yes. Yeah, <clears throat> I've been a, a vice president at my university for six years for academic affairs and quality. Um, and I have brought in digital themes and digital transformation issues um, at a broad scale there. And I can see that um, colleagues in universities, universities are composed of people and they are autonomous. And that's very, very important to be autonomous in this world because otherwise we cannot play this role as a reflection instance to society. Um, and uh, that is also um, 
differentiating us from other organizations in this society. Yeah? So um, there's always the need to take people on board. You cannot rule through every, um, uh, so to speak, faculty from above, but you really need to convince people. And that takes time. Democracy is very, very slow. And this is represented in old traditional universities. Um, they are very, very stubborn. But it is possible to go ahead, uh, it is possible to find pockets of innovation, to find enthusiasm, and it's, it's slow, I, I agree, but it is possible. Um, and uh, I think we have to learn, actually, as universities, as higher education institutions, the way and the mode how to transform in an ever faster changing society. I think we have to learn this. It's really a learning process. Um, uh, and how can we also, so to speak, make sure that the paths and the steps we are taking um, are good for us and good for society? So I, th I think this, this is important, uh, but I, I agree. But I think we are able to learn as universities, and uh, but it takes passionate people, uh, and then it. Okay. I can I can add something, you know, from Microsoft experience and in consulting, you know, organization on digital transformation, and usually you have thirty percent of people, you know, who are really in favor of change, right? Very enthusiastic about it, fresh ideas. Thirty percent who say. I don't really, it's okay for me, right? I'm, but I'm not going to push hard on this. And 30%, you have the rejectors who say, let's stay in the old world, right? And of course, you have to work with the enthusiasts and leverage them across the organization to seed, you know, this new spirit. But that's kind of our experience. It has changed during the pandemic, right? Because, you know, especially digital got a, a huge push. Um, but it's always this 30, 30, 30 thing, 33, right? Okay, thank you. Um, other questions, Inga? Um, I think um, the question of speed and how to adjust um, fast to uh, all the changes in the um, work environment was raised very often and I was wondering maybe um, we can think about how to ensure quality of education if our curricula or syllabi need to be so flexible which was, you know, flexible with integrating elements from um, micro licenses and so on. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe from a, from a startup perspective, uh, Daniel Schmelzer. So I, I have, I, the, the first thought that I had, do universities really need to be flexible? Um, or is, do they just have to shift the focus of teaching on a, on a, on a different level um, of teaching how to acquire the skill set of, of living in a, in, a, in a faster pace, in a, in a faster changing world. Um, and then is only the knowledge that you deliver only um, about more flexibility. That's the first thought I have. I think uh, the first thought that we need to, uh, that we really need to have is what is it that a university is there for? And then the pace doesn't change that much because um, solving problems will always be a skill that's necessary and media competence will always be a, a skill that's necessary only the question uh, what what is the things that you deal with with that competency that's the first part that i think and then the second part is experimenting mm -hmm. um when a startup thinks about a new problem it builds and measures and super simple nothing more than that um and that's something that uh a skill set that I've not that big institutions have a problem with in general, and I think that's also where universities have a, have a gigantic problem with, is just trying something out and seeing as it works, and really empirically having the, an understanding of how to determine if it works or if it doesn't work. And so that's my two parts of answers. I think it doesn't require as much of of a change. I think from an from an institution, from an academic institution, because I think if you think of a, about a lot of change, you're thinking the wrong level. And then the second thing I, I think is just do it and then find out if it worked afterwards. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, perfect. Terrific. Um, I think we're just just in time, uh, Inga. I guess um, let's uh, let's give the let's give the people <laughs> time to switch to the next session. Thank you very much uh, to my panel here. Um, a great contribution. Um, exciting discussion. And uh, let's let's stick to this uh, symposium to the very end, and there might be further questions uh, for you. So, 
Thanks again and uh, enjoy everyone the next session. Bye. Thank you. See you. Bye. Thank you.